begin today by turning to Deuteronomy, the 14th chapter. Certainly a appropriate section of scripture to turn this time of year as the feast approaches. Deuteronomy 14, verse 23, you shall truly tithe, for the word tithe means a tenth, all of the increase of your seed that the field brings forth year by year. This is the second tithe that is saved for the feast of tabernacles. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there. The tithe of your corn and of your wine and of your oil and the firstlings of your herds and of your flocks. Of course, we realize the, the uh, Israel blessing was an agrarian people at that time. That you may learn to fear or to reverence the Lord your God always. And if the way be too long for you so that you're not able to carry it, in other words, if they couldn't carry this tithe up, the grain and the, uh, their, their uh, animals, or if the pace place be too far from you, which the Lord your God should choose to set his name there, uh, when the Lord your God has blessed you, then you shall turn it into money and buy it up the money in your hand and shall go up into the place which the Lord your God shall choose. Of course, very practical advice of, be able to try, travel more lightly. And you shall bestow that money for whatsoever your soul lust or rightly desires after, for oxen, for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever your soul desires. And you shall eat there before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your household. So we, we understand it also, uh, it tells us in Ephesians 2, of verse 18 through 19, that we are the household of God. And uh, it is a feast not only for, of course, uh, enjoying and rejoicing ourselves, but to make sure the whole household of God, as well as our own private household, does rejoice. Because it is a very, it is the most joyful time of the year for God's people. And I know that uh, Jeanette, or one of my brethren, usually get me a big sack of pistachio nuts before I, I go up to the Feast of Tabernacles. And Jeanette complains about the... Uh, Shells that uh, some of them uh, get over into the car and uh, on the floorboard of the car, but we eventually get them out of there. But that, that is one of the ways I, I do rejoice, the pistachio nuts. I remember a long, long time ago, back in the Feast of Long Beach, there was, another, there was a minister, uh, what was his name, up in Denver? Uh, uh, I've forgotten his name. I'm having a senior moment right now. But anyway, but anyway he... Uh, he talked about how that uh, uh, Dr. Zimmerman, yeah, was right. He loved pistachio nuts. And he talked about how that was one of his great uh, foods he enjoyed at the Feast of Tabernacles. Was, uh, was he actually liked raw pistachio nuts? I prefer them roasted myself. But we all have the items that we do rejoice and enjoy in. But you know, sometimes the journey. For the Israelites, it was a very long journey, especially you have to remember that most of them traveled by foot. Ralph and I were discussing the other day whether or not Paul at times used a, a bro or a, a donkey to uh, travel on, uh, possibly, but irregardless, uh, especially if you had a large family. Uh, a 20 mile journey probably would have taken about a day. It actually, in the by the time of uh, Christ's time, it was actually considered a legal requirement for those Jews and Israelites living 20 miles from Jerusalem to attend the feast. But uh, for a large family living way, way off, it, it could be a, a very great challenge. And it was a lifelong dream for some of the Jews and the Israelites of the dispersion after that captivity, and after the dispersions. Uh, to be able to perhaps attend the feast in Jerusalem one time in their life before they die. It's interesting because James, if you turn to the book of James, the half-brother of Jesus Christ who wrote this letter, and it is interesting because it is a great letter of faith. You know, Paul talks in 1 Corinthians 13 about uh, how that uh, 1 Corinthians 13 as he wraps up 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 13, he says, And now abideth faith, hope, and charity or love, 
these three, but the greatest of these is charity or love. But it's interesting because you find this divine sequence in God's Word that James is an epistle of faith, First Peter, epistle of hope, and First John, the epistle of love. But here we find James speaking, and it's interesting because you'll find here him addressing the twelve. He says, James, a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad greeting. It's interesting because James is actually an English form of the word Jacob. And you, you can see here a spiritual para parallel of, of James uh, addressing the those who are now spiritual Israelites. Of course, we know it tells us clearly in Galatians 3 and verse 29 that if we are children of the faith, we are children of Abraham. But here he is addressing these 12 tribes which are scattered abroad greeting. And he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into different temptations. And the word there in the original Greek uh, can mean any type of trial. It doesn't necessarily have to mean a satanic type of temptation but it, or a, a lustful type of temptation, but any kind of trial that, that uh, we, do have, we do have to go through are required to go through. But he says, My brother, count it all joy when you fall into different trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works or develops patience or endurance, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And of course, over in First Peter, uh, you'll find Peter also addressing those of God's people who were scattered. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, First Peter one, to the chance to the, to the strangers, strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia. Asia and Bithynia elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. But you know, sometimes as Christians, one of our greatest trials of faith can be attending the Feast of Tabernacles. It can be a great test of faith. It isn't always easy. It oftentimes can be a, a, a very difficult journey and a very difficult challenge. And I know some of you who will be listening uh, to this message may have had at times a very, very difficult time making the journey to keep the feast, whether it be financial challenges or problems with your cars. And I know so many times right before the feast we're trying to, to get things ready. It isn't always easy. And we can be beset with many discouragements and obstacles in observing the feast. And as I mentioned quite often that you know the Apostle Paul statement over in Acts the 14th chapter Acts 14 when he occurs the brethren in verse 22 confirming the souls of the disciples Acts 14 and verse 22 and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation and much trial enter into the kingdom of God I don't think there's many of us who have been in God's church for any length of time who would have a difficult time putting an amen to that. The different trials and problems that we have and being able to, to attend the feast or, attend, or, or be able to, to walk the Christian walk. And as I mentioned, so many times that journey to the feast, that challenge to be able to observe the feast is very much like our journey towards the kingdom of God and those things that might resist us. I remember one feast that uh, we got outside Albuquerque and almost had to turn our car away and go back home because of the car troubles we began having. And our little son crying, uh, wanting to get there, wanting to go on. And I remember hitting, we got into Wagner and we hit a tire rim that a semi had spun off and it was still hot. <laughs> and we hit it and uh, damaged a tire and another little trial. And then I remember, I, I believe it was that same feast, our son, last great day of the feast, my wife said, well, he's in the shower. He had the shower all turned up crying because he didn't want us to hear us crying because he did not want to go home. It was that 
at a wonderful of a feast even for him and, and, and uh, as well as for us. But you know, God's people throughout history have often been called to make difficult journeys. We know that Abraham, who is our father in the faith, Genesis, the 12th chapter. Here we find this story, and in many ways it's probably the, the, the uh, first great calling. I mean, I'll, certainly some of the other men from the Bible were called. But here we find an example of a man who was called to make a journey. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get you out of your country, and from your kindred, and from your father's house unto a land that I will show you. We know if you drop back into the uh, chapter 11, it talks about how the, he had been called out of the city of Ur, the Chaldees. We know that Ur meant fire. We know that there were fire worshipers where Abraham grew up, or Abram at that, at that time was Abram, grew up. We know it tells us in Joshua 24 and verse 2 that Abraham's Descendants were idolaters, and it's interesting because if, if you if you follow the journey that Abraham made into the land of Canaan, as he drove, as he traveled up that fertile crescent up there towards the middle of that crescent, you'll see the, the a area called Haran, and the word meant delay. But we know that all that Abraham delayed for for a time before he came into to the promised land and we know that uh, tells us that his father Terah died there and probably the reason for that was because God did not want Terah bringing that idolatry into the promised land but he was, he was to leave and, and Philo an ancient historian tells us and of course you have to realize also that it was uh, Archaeologists tell, tell, tell us that the, the city actually where Abraham came from was a city of luxury. They've, uh, they've actually uncovered uh, wide paved streets and what was the equivalent of ancient uh, shopping malls. And so it was a, a very civilized area. Be it Philo, a, a Jewish historian that lived in the time of Christ, wrote in a biography about Abraham that he left home so quickly that it was almost like he was leaving a foreign place in order to go home. Because God had called him to make a journey. And he promises him, I will, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you should be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless you and curse the him, them, him that curses you. And in you, of course this is referring to Jesus Christ. I mean, when a side reference uh, in you there, referring to Christ, Galatians, the third chapter, verse 16, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. Of course, Haran, as I've said, was the middle part of the journey. And he took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and in the land of Canaan they came. We read again of the faith of Abraham in Hebrews, the 11th chapter. And I never grow weary of reading Hebrews 11, these old worn script passages of scriptures that always keep their meaning and their, their help and their sustenance and their encouragement for us as God's people. And Paul encourages us here in Hebrews 11 of verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. I mean, how, you know, how about you and I? Do we want to obtain a good report, I think all of us do. And the, the work we do for God's people and for His church, all of, the, all of that, our obedience, attending the feast, is all a good report. And through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that the things which are seen, which were not, are seen, were not made of things which do appear. 
And by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by he, it he being dead yet speaks. And by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. It was not found because God had translated him and moved him to another area. For before his translation, he had, or he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I mean, do we have that faith when we attend services or when we attend the feast that God will reward us? And by faith, Noah, being warned of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. And by faith, Abraham, when he was called, and here we find an example of faith that's driving his obedience, to go out into a, a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing where he went. As I mentioned so many times, you know, he didn't know where he was going, but, it, but he knew who was going with him. Well, oftentimes, we get in circumstances in our life, we don't know exactly where God has taken us, but we know he's with us. By faith, he sojourned, or he tabernacled in a land of promise, in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him in the same promise, of the same promise. So here we see part of the intrinsic meaning of the Feast of Tabernacles. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And it tells us, if we drop down at Hebrews 11, verse 13, These all died in faith, and having received the promises, but having not seen them, but having, having not received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and they embraced them. I, I love the way the King James Version uh, words this, that they embraced these promises. That close relationship we have with the promises of God. And they confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. It says, For they say such things, declare that they seek a country. And this is the kingdom of God that, that, that we are seeking. But now they desire a, a better country that is a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to, to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And this is one of the great meanings of the feast as we attend the future tabernacles that we seek something that's greater and far beyond this physical life. And he goes on to say towards over in Hebrews the 13th chapter in verse 14 for here we have no continuing city or no abiding city but we seek one to come. So we know that one of the great reasons as to why we attend the Feast of Tabernacles, we know that Jerusalem was a, the physical Jerusalem was a type of the spiritual heavenly Jerusalem that you and I are seeking to, to one day live and abide in and rejoice in. And we look for that city whose builder and maker is God. And far beyond what we experience now, we'll be talking about that as we continue. About that heavenly city that, that God has called us to. But you know, there's a great testimony that we receive from God when we attend the Feast of Tabernacles while we're there. There's a great testimony that we receive from God that Perhaps we may not have considered before. What is it? We'll be looking at that today. It may be a testimony that we may not we may not have fully considered before. And I would have to say for myself that would be so, as I 
began to look at some of the scriptures that, uh, to me, became more meaningful. But to consider that testimony, we'll need to turn another journey that Paul made, that one of God's people was required to make, Apostle Paul and Barnabas. And we find that story, we pick this up in Acts, the 13th chapter. At a very momentous time in the life of the church. Now there was at the church that was at Antioch, this was in Syria, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manan, which had been brought up with the hero of the Tetrarch, and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord. This is Acts 13 and verse 2. And they fasted. And the Holy Spirit said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called. And this was a calling. I believe all of us in God's church have a calling of some type. Where God is calling us. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And so being sent forth by the Holy Spirit, departed into Seleucia. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. Now this was Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey. It was about 45 A.D. Very historic period of time in the church. But let's drop down now to uh, later on in the journey in Acts, the 14th chapter. And if you trace uh, Paul's journeys, you can look, look up there in Asia Minor. Uh, what, was, what at that particular time was Galatia. Where Turkey's at today, and you, you look at the the uh, bottom of the map there, the bottom of Turkey, you'll find that he had what was called where, where he established the South Galatian churches. And he came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Of course, you know, I mentioned so many times that Satan will always hinder the work of God. It, it, it will never stop. But, the, um, but long before that, their long time therefore abode, they speak in boldly in the, in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and great, granted signs and wonders to be done by, the, by their hands. Well, the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. And there was made an assault made both of the, G the Gentiles and also the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them. They were aware of it and fled unto Lystra. I mean, sometimes God does expect us to use our heads. They're not wrong to flee. But they were aware of it, and they fled unto Lystra, and Derba, of course, these were the South Galatian churches, the cities of Laconia, and unto the region that lieth round about, and there they preached the gospel. Now, it's important to understand a little bit of background before we before we enter this section, because, of course, these were idolaters, and long ago, long ago, they had. There was a legend there in this particular area that, that uh, the chief god, uh, Jupiter or Zeus, came down to that area, along with uh, Mercury or Hermes would be the, the, uh, the Greek god, and uh, Hermes or Mercury was the messenger, was the messenger, uh, the god, the messenger god, and the chief god was Zeus. Greek god was Zeus, and Latin, of course, being Jew, the same god was Jupiter. But these two gods had come down to Lyconia, and they were rejected by the people. And there was only two individuals in that particular area, according to this legend, that accepted, uh, accepted uh, uh, Jupiter and Mercury, and uh, they were, their lives were spared. They were later on made the, the guardians of a splendid temple. When they died, the legend goes, they became these great trees. But the gods, according to this legend, these pagan gods, uh, Jupiter and uh, Mercury, destroyed and annihilated the population. So you have to understand what happened here is they did not want the same thing happening to them again. 
We know that uh, Barnabas had a very noble appearance. Uh, Paul obviously was the chief speaker, so they equated him with with uh, Mer Mercury, Mercurius, and uh, they equated uh, uh, Barnabas with, uh, with Zeus or Jupiter, the chief god, because of his noble appearance. And there sat there a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. And the same heard Paul speaking, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving, I know this is interesting what it says here, that he had the faith to be healed. Said with a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. He leaped and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. They didn't want, not want to make the same mistake they had made before. And they called Barnabas Jupiter, because as I said, he was the, the, had the, the chief god. Barnabas obviously had this noble appearance. And Paul Mercurius, that was because he was a messenger, he's chief speaker, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands on the gates, and would have done a sacrifice with the people, which were when the apostles and Barnabas heard of it, they rent their clothes and ran in amongst the people, crying and saying, Sir, why do you these things? We all serve men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth the sea, and all the things that are therein. And of course, this is very similar to what God states in regards to the Sabbath, as God be Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath being memorial of God's creation. But who in times past suffered or allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. But notice what he, he tells us here. This is the chief uh, scripture of this sermon. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, or without testimony, and that he did good, and he gave us rain from heaven, and fruitful seasons filling our hearts with food and gladness. So striking that what Paul is talking about, how that God fills our hearts, gives us this witness of how good God is, and, and what he gave, he gave rain from heaven and fruitful sea seasons filling our hearts with food and gladness. You know, every year at the Feast of Tabernacles, of course, we understand that the feast days were all based around the agricultural seasons of Israel. And uh, all of them are in concert with that. We, most of us, I'm not going to go back over some of the plowed ground about that. We know it's interesting because over in the epistle to the Ephesians, Paul makes a statement that oftentimes it's easy to lose in the way in the uh, English is written. But Paul tells us in Ephesians 1, in verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, and the Greek there actually means different harvest seasons, he might gather in together and want all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And we know that all of the harvest seasons of the holy days were in concert with and built around picture, just as they harvested these crops, it pictures how God harvested his people in his kingdom. All the way, it begins all the way back from Christ as the, the wave sheep offering that was offered during the days of unleavened bread is a picture of Christ to that uh, spring harvest of the, of the wheat, which was a you know, picture of the New Testament church, as well as uh, Old Testament Israel. And all of that, all the way to the last great day of the great harvest that's going to take place at the end of the millennium. And of course, in the millennium, the Feast of Tabernacles being a type of that 1,000-year period of time when this great spiritual harvest will take place as God harvests those living during that time into his kingdom. But we know that all of this came at the time of the, of, of the harvest seasons when the Israelites were so joyful. And we know, of course, it tells us in Exodus, the 23rd chapter, Exodus 23, 
Exodus 23, and verse 14. Three times shall you keep a feast unto me in the year. Exodus 23, and verse 14. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall, not, you shall eat unleavened bread seven days I commanded you in the time appointed of the month of Bib. For in it you came out of, from Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. And the feast of harvest, the first fruit of the labors, when you have sown in the field, the feast of the gathering, which is in the end of the year, when you've gathered in the labors out of your field. We know it was also called the feast of ingathering, because it came at the time, at the conclusion of Israel's feast. Eight days to rejoice in the goodness of God. And... Uh, it was a time when, you know, when you look at some of the false religions, the Stoicism, the Gnosticism has entered the church, and uh, a lot of the very Stoic uh, uh, ideas uh, of self-denial and, uh, you know, the, the perversion of, uh, of God's truth as picturing God as a very harsh God. And one of the great pictures of the Feast of Tabernacles it is a time, as it tells us, Leviticus 23, verse 38. And also in Leviticus 3, 23, and verse 38. Besides the Sabbath of the Lord, and besides your gifts, and beside all your vows, and beside all your free will offerings, which you give unto the Lord, also in the fifteenth day in the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. And it tells us, on the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. And you should take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, the branches of palm trees, and boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, and before the face of the Lord your God seven days. So it was eight days to rejoice in the goodness of God, of how good God is. It, was, it is a great testimony to the goodness of God. I want you to turn to Psalms, the, the 107th chapter. Great, great chapter that God has given us on His goodness. One of the... great attributes of God is His goodness. That we should never forget. And I hope that perhaps during the Feast of Tabernacles you'll take the time to read through Psalms 107 a couple of times at least. Because it is such a tremendous chapter. I, I've entitled it God's Goodness Chapter. That uh, talks so much about good, God's goodness. <clears throat> we'll give thanks. Unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Let the Redeemer of the Lord say so, whom He has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And as even as we keep the feast, and as we rejoice before Him, we should be talking about the goodness of God. And gather them out of the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. You know, of course, at the feast... God's people come together from all parts of the country. Individuals we may never have met if it hadn't been for the Feast of Tabernacles. But he's speaking, of course, at this time of physical Israel. And they wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way, and they found no city to dwell in. Uh, you know, there was no city to dwell in while they were out in the wilderness. You and I are in a type of wilderness now. And, we, and the the heavenly Jerusalem is not here yet. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in all their trouble, and He delivered them out of distresses. And He led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. And you know, just as God was, was bringing Israel to physical Jerusalem, that he might be able to, to inhabit Jerusalem, so he is also, Christ is bringing us to that heavenly city. You know, he talked about that. 
over in the book of John. John 14. John 14 and verse 1. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. John 14 and verse 1. In my Father's house are many mansions, and actually the Greek there is really many rooms. You can recall that the uh, uh, priest actually had rooms in the temple. And, And what we see here is not so much some pretentious mansion that people talk about having during God's kingdom, but it's going to be a situation where we we dwell together in heaven and Jerusalem as God's people. Remember, I used to think about that in Wagner, Oklahoma, that all the joyful time that we had there at the motel as we all dwelt together at the feast. And it's going to be far greater than that, but it's similar because we will be together with God's people. But he says, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And we, we know, of course, it tells us in Revelation, the, the 22nd chapter. Revelation 22, excuse me, 21 and verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Revelation 21 and verse 1. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. This is what Christ had talked about, that abiding city that you and I seek. Coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from her eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. And he that sat up on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for these things are true and faithful. And so uh, this is that heavenly city that you and I look to. It's one of the great reasons uh, why we observe the feast. But it tells us in verse, again in Psalms 107 or verse 7, And he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. And oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron. Because they rebelled against the words of God and they condemned the counsel of the Most High, Therefore he brought down their heart with labor, and they fell down, and there was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. And he brought them out of the darkness and the shadow of death, and he broke their bands asunder. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he has broken the gates of the brass and cut the bars of iron asunder, Because of their transgressions and because of their iniquities, they're afflicted. And their soul abhors all manner of meat, and they draw near the gates of death. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saves them out of their distresses. And he sent his word, and he healed them. And he delivered them from their destructions. And oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving, declare his works with rejoicing. And they that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. I mean, when we travel out in the ocean, you see these great whales that 
the jump out of the water and the dolphins, all that, it, it declares how good God is, His great His greatness. For He commands and raises a stormy sea, which lifts up the waves thereof. And they melt down to the heaven, and they go down again to the depths. And their soul is, is melted because of trouble. And they reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man, and are at their wit's end. Have you ever been at your wit's end? Then they cry. This is what James talks about when he talks about fervent prayer. Under the Lord in their trouble, and he brings them out of their distresses. And he makes the storm a calm so that the ways they're ever still. And then they are glad because they be quiet, so he brings them into their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt Him also in the congregation of the people and praise Him in the assembly of the elders. He turns rivers into a wilderness and the water springs into dry ground and a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. He turns the wilderness into a standing water and dry ground into water springs. And there He makes the hungry to dwell that they may prepare a city for habitation. We know, of course, that he prepared for physical Israel a city of habitation. And we know some of the great stories that took place there, of even when they returned out of captivity, and, and of Ezra and Nehemiah who helped to build Israel, build the walls of Jerusalem, make, make it a city for habitation. The feast is a foretaste of the goodness of that heavenly city. It is a foretaste of that. And as you and I observe the feast and as we rejoice in the wonderful food and the fellowship and all the wonderful sermons that we hear, it is all a foretaste of the goodness of God. You know, Peter, James, and John once had a foretaste of the kingdom of God in that city of habitation. And we read that in Matthew, the 17th chapter. In verse 1, And after six days, Jesus takes Peter and James and John, his brother. There's something very... Wonderful is ready to happen. And God is going to give them a foretaste of what God's kingdom and that heavenly city will be like. And he brings them up to a high mountain apart and was transformed figure before them. And his face did shine as a sun. And his raiment was as white as the, as the, as the light. You know, it's a picture of the glory of God that we will see in his kingdom and in heavenly Jerusalem. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And, and you can just sense the way Peter felt as, as God gave Peter and the, and the James and John that this foretaste, this picture, this revelation of what God's kingdom is going to be like. Then answered Peter and said unto to the Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. He's almost talking out of his head at this point. He says, he says if, if you will, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. It's almost like a little child talking. Let's, this is a wonderful place. Let's camp out. Let's tabernacle together. And while he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud over, overshadowed him. Behold, a voice out of the cloud said, which said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am pleased. Hear you him. You know, I'm sure that sometime during the Feast of Tabernacles, probably several times during the feast, is it being a foretaste of that heavenly city, a foretaste of God's kingdom, that you're, you're going to stop and say, it really is good to be here. And every year at the feast, we receive a testimony and a witness that indeed, God is good.